Good evening. We are going to have a live session now. And in the next two hours, we are going to cover pediatrics and neonatology. The first one hour, I am going to do general pediatrics. And from the next one hour, Dr. Leslie will be doing. I am Dr. Pushpakini from the Department of Pediatrics, KMC Manipal. This session is going to be very lively as well as a good learning experience for all of you, I am sure. And we have taken the trouble to compile all the previous year questions which are important. I am sure if you go through this, uh, pediatrics you can do very well in your entrance exam. Now I am going to go to the questions now. Please look at this and uh, then we will respond. The first question here is, which can be used as an alternative to mother, other than mother, uh, mother's milk for low birth weight babies? The option is cow's milk, preterm formula, term formula, human donor milk. If you ask me, this is a very easy question. Nobody should uh, find it difficult at all. So the option here, oh, I see Ketan. Ketan Bhagat, uh, good evening. KK, good evening. I'm sure you saw the question now. What's the option? D, yeah. I see Sakshi and KK, D is the correct answer. Human donor milk is the best substitute for baby's own mother's milk, especially for low birth weight. Now, the difference between cow's milk and mother's, mi uh, mother's milk is everybody should know. Both have same quantity of water, both give the same calories, that is 67 calories per 100 ml. But when it comes to protein, the cow's milk and the human milk. In human milk, the you can roughly remember it is 1 gram per 100 ml. The range is 0.9 to 1.5 grams. And the protein content in cow's milk is more. That is roughly 3 times the more, 3.3. And then comes fat is almost same. Lactose, when you see mother's milk has more lactose than uh, cow's milk. And whey protein here is 60-40 ratio. The casein is 40, whey protein is 60. Whereas in uh, uh, cow's milk, it's 48 and 82, 4.8 and, sorry, 82 and 18. Now, calcium content in the cow's milk is more, all of us know and phosphorus is more. When humanizing the milk, what we have to do is, we have to see that the cow's milk, let's say has more protein, more calcium and more phosphorus. Let's accept now for the low birth weight baby, the best milk is human donor milk. Good evening Sakshi, good evening Dr. Jane. We go to the next question now. Again, it's an easy question for me. A four year old male baby, Body weight of 15 kg, height of 100 cm, is admitted with normal uh, with renal failure. His blood urea is 100 mg per deciliter. Serum creatinine is 1 mg per deciliter. What is the closest calculated EGFR in the patient? Yes, the answer is... I don't see the answer here. Here the answer is 40 ml per meter per minute per 1.73 meter square. You should know the body surface area formula is EG of R is calculated for it is ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. There is a constant K into height in centimeter. Serum creatinine is in milligram per deciliter. Here the constant is 0.43. And this can be used for, uh, for GFR between 15 to 75 ml per minute per 1.73 meter square. And can be done age between 1 to 16 years. So the answer here was B, that is 40 ml. If you say 0.4 into height of the baby was 100 and serum creatinine was 1. So it was 40 ml per minute per 
1.73 meter square. I hope this question is easy. Yes, the next question is adrenocorticotrophic hormone is the drug of choice in which of the following conditions? Anybody? Please write the answer. Sanjay says D. B. Dr. Jane B. Yes. Dr. Jane B. No. It's C. KK says the right answer is West syndrome. Yes. Sakshi, KK and Dr. Jane C. Right answer. Here, West syndrome is a typical trial of uh, epileptic spasm. That's myoclonic seizures, EEG, showing hypsarrhythmia and mental retardation. It's a very bad disease to have. The children will definitely have uh, growth, uh, global developmental delay and typical hypsarrhythmia in EEG and the child comes for refractory seizures, typically myoclonic seizure. I'm sure all of you know how the myoclonic seizure comes. It comes like sudden flexion of the head. Sometimes the hands will go like this, that's flexor spasm. Sometimes the hands will go extension. So once you decide it's myoclonic seizure, you do an EEG. If there is a hypsarrhythmia and there is global developmental delay, typically West syndrome. And the drug of choice here is ACTH. ACTH is um, the only, probably if somebody can ask you, which is the hormone used in treatment of uh, seizures in babies is ACTH. Otherwise, it is prednisolone. So I hope this question was easy for you. Next question, regarding urinary tract infection in children, which is the, which of the following is true? When I construct MCQ, you know, initially I used to think like, let's say, MCQ helps you to think analytically. It helps you to point, be very specific in your answer. So, but when we construct M MCQs, uh, the stem and the options, if they are very short, the question is likely to be easy. But please be careful if a question has except, true, false, you know, and if there are double negative, we should be very careful. Here, the question is regarding urinary tract infection in children, which is the which of the following is true? The answer is most common cause of UTI in streptococcus pneumonia. Bladder bowel dysfunction is common. Is the risk factor in UTI? Cotrimoxyl is not given. MCU is done in children with recurrent UTI. So you can see the options here. Most of the time, bowel bladder dysfunction is common in these children and MCU is done in all children who have recurrent UTI. Okay, some in, in a ma male baby with poor urine stream, with the first UTI also we can do MCU. But in girl children, recurrent UTI you should do MCU. And bladder bowel dysfunction, this is again a learning experience for me to realize constipation increases the risk of UTI and in UTI these children can have constipation too. So the answer here you will take 2 and 4 together that becomes response is B. Clear? Most common cause of UTI is E. coli. It is not streptococcal pneumonia and Cotrimoxyl we use for suppressive antibiotic in VUR and um, MCU is done in all children with recurrent UTI. Next question, handedness is seen in the age of 1 year, 2 year, 3 year, 4 years. This is very important. You know, like typically, you know, you'll see the, at four or six months, the child learns to go with bidextrous, then it becomes unidextrous. So, which year the child will have typically handedness is hand dominance. If it is in a less than two-year-old child, okay, you will see that probably there is weakness on one side. If you see a three-month-old using only or a six-month-old reaching for at left hand only and not moving the right hand, there may be problem. So, if hand dominance is there, which is the answer? I see different responses here. At three years, okay, C is the correct answer here. By three years, 
the hand dominance should be there. In less than two years, if you see, let's say, you see only left hand use and no right hand movement at all, it may be a clue that the child has hemiparesis or cerebral palsy. Which of the following cyanotic heart disease causes increased pulmonary blood flow? This, which is the answer, Epstein's anomaly, tetralogy of phallo, transposition of great vessels, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Which of this has increased pulmonary blood flow? Answer here is, yeah, I see many answering as C, C is correct here, that is, Transposition of great arteries and TAPVC has increased blood flow, whereas tetralogy of fallow and Epstein have decreased blood flow. So, this question is often asked. Now, let us see the algorithm, how easily you can remember this. Any child with heart disease, you will have a cyanotic heart or cyanotic heart. Let us go with the flow of cyanotic heart. In cyanotic heart, either it is decreased blood flow or it is increased blood flow. Decreased blood flow is only two tetralogy of fallows and tricuspid atresia, whereas increased blood flow you will see in TGA, TAPVC, truncus arteriosus and hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Again, a word of caution here, you know, you remember now TOF is commonly oligemic lung field. Then tricuspid atresia, oligemic lung field. Increased blood flow in the other T's, that is TGA, TAPVC and truncus. So, this is with the cyanotic heart. If you have to go through and analyze a cyanotic heart disease, you can consider a cyanotic heart as volume overload or pressure overload. Volume overload is typically ASD, VSD, PDA. Like you know, where you see left to right shunts. Sometimes AV, regurgitation and occasionally cardiomyopathy. But most of the time, volume overload is left to right shunt for us. Whereas pressure overload, you can have outflow obstruction or inflow obstruction. The outflow obstruction is typically at the valve or below the valve or above the valve. So, you have to decide now whether it is valvular pulmonic, pulmonic stenosis, whether it is valvular aortic stenosis or coarctation of aorta. If it is below the valve, like in double chambered right ventricle or subbiotic membrane, this is rare, there may be outflow obstruction. Above the valve, when we say it is branch pulmonary stenosis, peripheral pulmonary artery stenosis or supravalvular aortic stenosis. So, again, increased blood flow you get in TAPVC and trunk, TGA. 11 year old boy was brought to the outpatient with intentional tremors, poor scholastic performance. His sister has similar complaints on examination, hepatomegaly is seen. The eye findings are shown in the following image. What is the probable diagnosis? Yes, Sakshi or Dr. Jain. Yeah, I think Wilson is a very easy, very easy option. You will see one typically brownish green ring here and this is cave ring. Whenever I see cave ring in the OPD, it is one excitement for me. Most of the time cave ring is seen by slit lamp examination, but some children do have uh, macroscopically visible cave ring and if you see cave ring, the diagnosis is done quickly, okay. So, the answer here was very easy for me, but for you, you should remember if you see a cave ring, it is Wilson. This is taught to you and it is very easy question, but when a case comes with these problems, that is tremors or poor scholastic performance, you have to look at the eye and look for cave ring. Okay, this is typically, if not seen also, you should get a slit lamp examination and uh, confirm the diagnosis. Now, diagnosis is very easy here, KF ring and the option is A. 
what goes wrong in wilson disease when we say it's a multi organ disease it is herido familial and you will see sometimes the brother sister both had the same complaint and the brunt of the disease most of the time we see in the liver or in the brain what do we see in the liver is hepatomegaly jaundice and acute hepatitis fulminant hepatitis comes as cirrhotic liver with portal hypertension and sometimes with esophageal varices this is one common manifestation usually children above 5 only or 3 to 5 years only come with jaundice and here the history is recurrent jaundice so if the, any child has recurrent jaundice you we have to be careful and entertain the possibility of wilson disease look at the eye and shine a torch and see whether macroscopically kf ring is there if macroscopically kf ring is there and you, you make a quick diagnosis you are always called as a good clinician so what does it do in the bone it can come with joint pains like arthritis or it may be features of rickets may be there the mo next common system to be involved is cns and here they can come with you know scholastic deterioration handwriting deterioration abnormal movements uh, dysarthria emotional lability or excessive salivation mask like faces we don't have parkinson in children but you know if somebody gets a typical disease like this of the extra pyramidal or the basal ganglia it is wilson for us so they may come with mask like faces have swallowing difficulty if you have i have a child now with wilson his problem is you know with medications he is able to move and he can is able to flex and extend his gait has improved but swallowing difficulty he takes one hour to eat his normal meal so cns they can have all this problem and this macroscopically positive kf ring is a good diagnosis in clinically if not seen you should do a slit lab examination and confirm on the kidney it can come with proximal tubular dysfunction heart is rarely involved in my practice i didn't see wilson and heart but you know they can come with congestive cardiac failure hematologic manifestations you know sometimes they come with hemolytic anemia acquired hemolytic anemia this also is to be known so if you know if somebody asks you what is the cause of common cause of acquired hemolytic anemia you can say malaria okay but in if there is a family history of uh, jaundice and if there is anemia you know either the patient has lost the blood in the stool a melina okay because of cirrhosis or another reason is this child has anemia probably because there is acute hemolytic anemia so in wilson which is the type of hemolytic anemia you get your answer is hemolytic anemia so i see now jamula ramya and rahul have joined good evening the next question we go a child presents with the acute exacerbation of asthma which of the following would you do chest x ray oxygen administration salbutamol nebulization 3 times in 1 hour administration of glucocorticoids this is mcq so you should know what is the priority of your work okay so you whether you, which is the first option for you when you say here the answer is going to be what will you do let me see the answer yes dr jain has written d kk has written d answer is d here okay so you will do oxygen first administration of oxygen salbutramol nebulization that is uh, in 20 minutes one that means in one hour you give three times and then give oral corticosteroids chest x ray is the next priority okay so uh, how do i pick up a good student when they write exam answers you know one who writes oxygen i feel very happy if they don't write oxygen you know and then just write salbutamol and steroids i don't think it's a correct way to do so answer here is you will do 2 3 4 and the option is d so d is the correct answer you do chest x ray not routinely you know but there are sometimes i have done x ray when there is asymmetry let's say i think there is acute wheeze but the left side there is no air entry at all that is the situation you think of a complication but generally first thing as the child comes till you stabilize you will do oxygen nebulization and oral steroid and nebulization is beta agonist that salbutamol in one hour you can give three times now 
I am I am sure all of you are probably familiar with the this process of you know how to go about this algorithm I am sure all of you who are preparing for exams are well versed with it what is the primary thing here to remember is decide whether it's mild moderate severe okay mild moderate put on one side severe is one severe you should not waste time so once you decide here has come with acute or subacute then is it asthma because all that visas is not asthma sometimes but here we are discussing only asthma so is it asthma we will say and the factors for asthma related whether there is any other complication you will see and how bad is it so if it is life threatening goes to icu suddenly and if it is mild moderate you will try with only like as i discussed now salbutamol oral steroids oxygenation and of course the fifth vital we should thank pulse oximetry throughout the child should be monitored with pulse oximetry going to the next question now a young man is brought to the hospital with high grade fever and altered consciousness has neck rigidity pain when bending the neck a lumbar puncture performed shows wbc count of 1500 cells majority being neutrophils and protein is 120 mg per deciliter glucose is 70 mg whereas blood sugar blood glucose is 300 how how will you manage this index case options are Piperacillin tazobactam, amphotericin flucytosin, vancomycin ceftriaxone, antitubercular treatment. I see Sahu Patil saying C, very good. Sakshi C, Dr. Jane C, very good. The answer is vancomycin and ceftriaxone. You know, ceftriaxone covers the gram negative spectrum, whereas uh, vancomycin covers the gram positive spectrum. Here you will not write anti-tubercular at all. You know this, uh, this and uh, Piper's intazobactam I will not opt because CNS penetration is poor. Amphotericin and flutocytosin also very easy to eliminate here. You ask me this question is very easy because amphotericin you will use only for reserved cases. Here you remember now typically it is looking like pyogenic meningitis. Okay, so it's a protein is high, cells are more, sugar is little less. So, it is pyogenic meningitis. The best option for this child is vancomycin and septraxone. Now, one word about piperacillin tazobactam. Very good drug, but CSF penetration is not so good. So, there is nothing like septraxone as, as good penetration. Vancomycin has good penetration. And so, this option, septraxone, vancomycin should be the correct answer here. So, which of the following increases the risk of recurrence of febrile seizures? Age less than 1 year, temperature 38 to 39, duration of fever less than 24 hours, duration of fever 48 hours, more than 48 hours. What is the option here? Yeah, I think everybody finds uh, pediatrics easy. I see many uh, correct answers. Uh, Sakshi, Jane, KK, uh, Sahu Patil. Everybody has written C. Yes, good. Because see here is, you know, you will say fibrile seizure uncommon after 48 hours. Okay, so it is in the first 24 to 48 hours. So, age, vulnerable age is 6 months to 6 years. Temperature, yes, 38 to 39. Sometimes it is the rate of rise of temperature that is important. Suddenly, the temperature short and the baby developed a seizure. And most of the time, the seizure is it is on the first day of fever. That is less than 24 hours. So, here the option is C. We will move to the next question now. Yes. In February, and again explanation here, there are some major and minor criteria. You know, this is important to counsel parents when they come for 
this. You know, you can um, meet a young parent, you know, when they come and say, oh, they will be very scared of febrile seizure and they will always be asking two questions to you. Will it come again? Will, she, will this child develop seizure as they grow? Okay, so age less than one year, duration of fever less than 24 hours, fever between 38 to 39 is major criteria. Family history of febrile seizure, family history of epilepsy, complex febrile seizure, daycare management, male gender or sodium low at the time of admission. These are major and minor criteria. No risk factor, what is the risk, risk of recurrence? If there is no risk factor, approximately 12 percent. If one risk factor is there, it becomes 25 to 50 percent recurrence. Two risk factors are there, 50 to 59 percent. More than three, three or more than three risk factors, it becomes 73 to 100 percent. When there are many risk factors, you know, most of the time if it's complex febrile seizure, there is always another way of managing these children. So, it is good to know this major minor criteria and good to know this incidence of recurrence to counsel the parents. So, I see some new people coming. Good evening, Manjanath. So, we go to the next question here. Choose the most appropriate answer. I do not like this type of MCQs, okay. But then, when somebody is asking, better be prepared. So, if the stem is long and if the options are also long, uh, there is a tendency for the candidate to get confused. But if you have a sound knowledge into the disease process, then you will probably find it easy. So, now look at this question which is little bit different from the usual questions that are asked. Choose the most appropriate answer. So, in filial cutaneuria, urine has a mousy odor. That is the assertion. The reason here is it is uh, high levels of tyrosine, dopamine, norepinephrine are decreased. The serum levels are decreased in this in phenyl ketonuria. And the options given here are I think people are answering this now. I see Dan Lakshmi, good evening. Yeah, right. Both assertion and reason are independently false statements. The assertion is independently a true statement but the reason is independently a false statement. Both assertion and reason are independently true statements, but the reason is not the correct explanation for assertion. Option D here is both assertion and reason are independently true and the reason is the correct explanation for the assertion. So, what is the answer here? I see C again. Many have answered C. Sakshi, Dr. Jain, KK have answered it as C, which is correct. You know, both assertion and independent reason are independently true, correct, because in phenyl ketonuria, urine is mousy odor, correct. Then in phenyl ketonuria, phenylalanine to become tyrosine, you need phenyl hydroxylase enzyme that is deficient. So, what happens? All these other things like dopamine, tyrosine and all are decreased, okay. So, independently that is true. But the reason for urine having mousy odor is not the enzymes that, that is uh, decreased uh, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine and tyrosine. It is because high levels of phenylalanine in the urine that causes mousy odor. The answer here is C. Is that clear? This is a little difficult question myself. I found it like that. But I am sure you are uh, more smarter in answering all these type of questions. So, C is the right answer here. The mousy odor of urine in phenylketonuria is because of increased phenylalanine in the urine. So, there you know they attributed in the reason for other amino acids. But here it is increased phenylalanine which causes mousy odor in the urine. Of course, tyrosine dopamine levels will be less because phenylalanine is not converted to these uh, uh, amino acids because phenyl hydroxylase enzyme is deficient in phenyl ketonuria. We move on to the next question. A child is brought to the casualty with a history of choking. On examination, there is decreased air entry in the left lung. What would be the correct management? Bronchoscopy, CT uh, chest, uh, ICD insertion, chest x-ray. 
I'm waiting for the response. Option A is 1, 2, 4. Option 2 is 1 and 2. C is 3 and 4. And D is 1 and 4. What will you do? Correct. Option D. Sahu Patil has written option D. Sakshi has written D. I think Sakshi has got everything right. Very nice. So, option uh, 1 and 4. This child needs a bronchoscopy. This child needs a chest x-ray. I will do first chest x-ray because feasible to do immediately. And if chest x-ray shows, let's say there is a total collapse on the left lung, that is because of which the air entry is decreased then there is need for bronchoscopy. We do not do CT scan as a first uh, order uh, nor do we insert ICD first. So, the option here will be D. You will do bronchoscopy and do chest x-ray. First chest x-ray, then bronchoscopy. So, in suspected foreign body aspiration, if air entry is reduced in one side and, and uh, if it is radio opaque object, okay, then X-ray will help. Bronchoscopy becomes therapeutic. Recently, I had one problem. One uh, nurse's child. She came and said, "This child has swallowed a bead." Okay, I examined. There was no decreased air entry. There was no tachypnea. Just cough. So I told, if I do CT scan or chest X-ray immediately, I will look like one. I did a chest X-ray. I could not see any foreign body. I said, "Sister, I can't make out anything. Just wait one day. We will wait and see." And next morning, she came in again, coughing, coughing. So I did a CT thorax and there I found a bead with the hole. This bead had gone and plugged the lumen of the lower, bron lower bronchiole and had allowed air to go in. That's why clinically I got uh, side track. But CT scan showed me the bead there. You know? But there in, the, in this MCQ that is asked, we will first do chest x-ray then do a bronchoscopy. Chest x-ray will help you to pick a radio opaque object if it is seen but not all foreign bodies are radio opaque but this answer here is d okay so now comes the next question a nine month old boy presents with a progressive pallor and abdominal distension the peripheral smear done is shown as in the image menzer's index is less than 13 what investigation need to be done in this patient So now I wait for your response. Yes. Thirteen. Yeah, Sakshi is right here. C. Very good. C is you will do HPLC and you will do peripheral blood smear. The first thing you will do is peripheral blood smear. I think KK, Dr. J and all have answered it as C. That's right. Those who have opted for other options, please uh, write in your brain now. I am not going to tick this. I am going to tick only HPLC and I am going to do peripheral smear. Between the two, I will get peripheral smear quick response. Okay, I will have that response. Uh, within maybe uh, half a, a day, I will get the peripheral smear which shows microcytic hypochromic target cells, okay, anastocytosis, phycocytosis, and the whole mark there is nucleated RBCs. The marrow which is in a hurry will send, uh, you know, immature RBCs. So, you will see nucleated RBCs. So, first uh, here, you will do peripheral smear and you will confirm the diagnosis by HPLC. The two options which are right are 1 and 4. So, the answer becomes C here. So, again, I consider this as a straightforward, simple question. Everybody should get it right. You will not opt for PTAPTT here because uh, hemolytic anemia, th thalassemia, no business to ask for a liver dysfunction. Okay, so and bone marrow, only in certain situations in hemolytic anemia, we will do bone marrow. I can give you spontaneous random MCQ now. Which uh, hemolytic anemia you will clinch the diagnosis by a bone marrow. Can anybody write? You know, this is a spontaneous question for you. You know, where the bone marrow will help you to pick up a hemolytic anemia. I wait two seconds here for an answer. You can type and tell me. No? Okay. You know, I, I can give the answer for short of time. I will not wait for you to write. You can remember, like sideroblastic anemia, you will pick up only by 
doing a bone marrow okay so you will not know from peripheral smear so sideroblastic anemia will clinch the diagnosis by doing a bone marrow and in sickle cell if there is a plastic crisis you will have to probably do a bone marrow to see what is the reason for pancytopenia moving on to the next question over here actually abdominal distension pallor in a child with hepatosplenomegaly menser index less than 13 again this can be a question for you less than 13 menser index is always a suspicion to rule out hemolytic anemia more than 13 you still can think in terms of iron deficiency anemia peripheral smear will show typical target cell microcytic hypochromic anemia and diagnosis is always confirmed by hplc here moving on to the next question a child presents with complaints of fever rash body ache throat pain has a history of thorn prick injury recently which antibiotic will you give to this child empirical antibiotic what is the choice here option is ceftriaxone amoxiclav vancomycin meropenem all got it right uh, i think uh, uh, dr jain sakshi sahu patil kk right it's b right it's again easy question here Rem uh, look at the catch here the other drugs they have been uh, they're all parenteral antibiotics okay ceftriaxone meropenem vancomycin nobody will use them as first line and best thing is amoxiclav covers the streptococcus lesion fell and the child has presented with fever and rash body ache which may be like in scarlet fever okay scarlet fever is uh, not so common for us in india the last i saw was a girl who came from uk and she was all pink 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 everywhere you know and she said as and i was thinking is this scarlet fever she said all in my school had scarlet fever so uh, here if you think in terms of streptococcus amox and clavulanic acid is the right answer so b becomes the option for us to take consider it as a easy question only so sus suspected scarlet fever you will always use amoxicillin and clavulanic acid okay the uh, penicillin group of drugs are the best before uh, advent of clavulanic acid amox was our favorite but then you know clavulanic acid makes the response fast moving on to the next question now a child with thalassemia is undergoing multiple blood transfusion what is the best method to uh, detect the iron overload because all of us know iron overload is going to be a challenge in the treatment of hemolytic anemia that is thalassemia children okay so liver iron concentration mri of the myocardium serum ferritin or ntbi which one is the answer here i see sahu pile correct a very good yeah it's liver iron concentration okay if you consider take the liver biopsy and see how much ferritin is there that's the best the other options are there in the evolution of the in the management of uh, this but here the answer is that correctly to know how much iron overload is there you can do the ferritin in the liver moving on to the next question now how would you manage a child with status epilepticus airway and breathing lorazepam propofol thiopentone phosphenetoin which combination will you use o option a is 1 2 3 4 option b is 2 1 4 3 c is 1 3 4 2 d is 1 2 4 3 I think everybody fine. Actually, I tell I also don't like this type of questions, but I don't see. No, here the answer is B. Okay, B is two one four three. Two one four three means first, you know, you will do airway breathing, lorazepam, phosphenetoin. Okay, and last come propofol and thiopentin. So, you know, the most, you should always stick for the most practical one. We will not go for propofol and thiopentin for everybody first. Okay? It will not be there. So, you use your uh, general knowledge or your, your just go through your analytical thinking. Everybody needs airway breathing. Lorazepam is the first drug you will use. Next drug, if not, you will use phosphenetoin. 
and in refractory seizures only you will use propofol thiopentone. So it becomes airway breathing whichever has lorazepam and phosphenitoin. So one which has, so answer here becomes Sitin is D, okay, one, one, two, and four, and three. Okay, three, uh, three option comes last. Okay. Yeah, I think some answers as D correct. Very nice. Okay, right. This algorithm, I'm sure you are also familiar. Uh, I can go quickly here. You know, like all of us, as soon as the child arrives, what should we do? You know, we'll always, everybody will say airway, breathing, circulation will maintain, will do fine. And pre-arrival, we may have to keep things ready. All those things which are required in the crash cart should be there. That is, you will keep a non-rebreathing mask, you will keep bag mask ventilation ready, suction ready, it may be oral nasal suction and pulse oximeter there. IV, to start IV line, you will keep the catheters and probably you know you will uh, interosseous if needed and some of this uh, the best things that have happened here is uh, note this that is you, you all of us have glucometer so you can shoot the blood sugar immediately but similarly you can have good good report with probably sodium potassium calcium magnesium and the uh, bicarb status of the child so to and you know this way you can probably think what is the cause so the two things that should happen for simultaneously what is the cause for this status how do i stop the seizures so keep things ready Ongoing seizures, if there are more than 5 minutes, you will have to decide, you know, what, how do I proceed every 5 minutes. You know, first 5 minutes what I will do, 6, 10, 10, 20, by 30 minutes I should be uh, achieving good control in these children. I am sure it is good to, you know, it's a, but the basic thing to remember here is benzodiazepines are very good. You know, say, uh, which benzodiazepine will I use? You know, as a postgraduate I use diazepam. Then came Midazolam. Then came lorazepam. What is the advantage of all these three? Midazolam, quick action, short action. Within 20 minutes, you will have very good action and uh, they last for short period only. Whereas benzodiazepine, long action, it will cover. Lorazepam is the longest action. So, uh, one of the three you can use. That is benzodiazepine. In that, it is the first now tendency to use midazolam. Then can be lorazepam. Lorazepam will cover for nearly 12 hours and diazepam. One of them you can use and your uh, mind should go with simultaneously as I said. You are controlling the seizure here. At the same time, you are giving importance to diagnostics. That is, you will do probably sodium, potassium, calcium. You know, check the blood pressure, whether it is hypertension, encephalopathy which has come with seizure to you and secure a IV access. Sometimes it's difficult to get IV access in a child who is convulsing. Okay, so what we have to do that time? Maybe rectally we can give. So in next option, you know, you can go through this uh, for short of time. I will go through this quite fast. You know, you, when it is more than if you have tried midazolam and uh, or lorazepam, you have option to give phosphenitoin. Then you have option to give valproate, and then later you can go to phenobarbitone. And only in some cases you will go for this propofol and ketamine. Going to the next question. A child presents with cold feet and a history of wearing socks even in the summer. On examination, lower limb pulses are diminished as compared to radial pulse. There is a prominent radiofemoral delay present. Which is the underlying condition? This should be very easy for all of you. I hope all of you, if you get this question, should answer correctly. You cannot go wrong in this at all. Yes, yeah. I say answer B here. Dr. KK has written, Dr. Jane has written B. Very good. Coactation of iota. Clue is very simple. Forget the socks and all. The femorals are weak. Radiofemoral delay is there. Okay. And that is typical of coactation of iota. So, you know, you can diagnose co coactation in infancy. I have had the chance to detect co coactation in infancy only once. And um, coactation in older children twice I have sent for stenting. So, you can de detect in infancy, childhood, adolescence, or sometimes in adult ward also they may pick up a coactation there. And here another MCQ can come, which are the associated syndromes where you can get coactation. Answer should be Turner syndrome first, okay. Typically in girls, XO, you will get coactation as a common. So one more MCQ you can have in mind now. 
which condition you get coarctation in a as an association you can get in one recklinghausen disease or nonan syndrome or congenital rubella i have not seen in congenital rubella i have seen it in part of uh, turner syndrome routinely all turner syndrome we do one uh, screening to see when we do echo we'll tell the cardiologist specifically look rule out coarctation of aorta next question an unconscious child is brought to the casualty what is the correct sequence of management this is breathing pulse response start compression back and mask ventilation yes i think uh, option is c here that you will do ss response first then as is breathing as is pulse start compression then do bag and mask ventilation one good thing that I, response here is yes i see the response here c correct uh, only few have written c right here please remember first you will do ss response breathing then you will see pulse start compression and then do bag, bag and mask ventilation one good thing now i'll go quickly through this because every one of you by the time you become intern you are getting trained to do cpr so and you know the algorithm to go forward please go through the books and uh, be sure with this next question which of the following statements are true regarding cytomegalovirus infection neonates are asymptomatic at birth have lesser risk of later sequelae 20 to 40% are symptomatic at birth in developing countries the rate of transmission of cme infection to infant is more common from primary maternal infection than reactivation diagnosis by urine specimen at 4 weeks of age yes correct i think dr jain has written the correct answer d that is d is neonates are who are asymptomatic at birth are very unlikely to have risk at a later sequelae and diagnosis uh, and developing countries rate of transmission of cme infection to the infant is more common from primary metal infection than re re reactivation these two are correct so one and three response is d so answer is d here yeah i think few got it right but sakshi i think for one sakshi did a no it's not a 20 the hormone that does not play a role in the growth of the fetus sees insulin growth hormone thyroxine glucocorticoids this is the type of mcq i like okay right a short question short to the point answer and very easily we can do if this type of question is there i don't mind answering 300 questions okay yeah growth hormone correct growth hormone plays a role later in life not in infants okay right so fetus no so the fetus the hormone that's important for us is thyroxine insulin and steroids okay growth hormone role is later which of the following statement is true regarding tape shown in the image shelter tape as to assess severe malnutrition reading 13.5 to 14.5 is considered as undernourished Uh, mainly useful for the front line workers so you look for which options here b correct b is correct i think I, everybody found it easy very good it's not shelter tape so it's a shakir tape okay severe so malnutrition right field uh, front uh, health workers right okay so reading 13.14.5 is wrong So here, when you say shaky tape, more than thirteen point five is normal. Twelve point five to thirteen point five centimeters is borderline. Less than twelve point five is wasted. Okay, so red, yellow, green. This is shaky tape. Which of the following is true statement about congenital CME infection? Twenty to thirty percent of the infections are asymptomatic. Are symptomatic. Thread of uh, sensory neural hearing loss, periventricular calcification, enamel hypoplasia. Most children are asymptomatic at birth, can develop conducting hearing loss later life. If mother is IgG positive for CMB, child is unlikely to develop infection, which is correct.
I think Dr. Jain got it right and Sahu Patil also got it right. D. Mother, if, if it's IgG, that means she's got it long back. Okay, so she is unlikely to transfer. She is IgM positive means recent infection. So the answer is D here, that is 22. Going to the next question. Which of the following is given as a part of therapy for a child with severe COVID? Corticosteroid, Ivermectin, Remdesivir, all of the above. Yeah, I see KK right, KK and Sahu Patil right, that's corticosteroids, okay, this is, this is the only drug that is proved, okay, rest all are all, uh, so I think many are writing A now, uh, Tarun Rao, there is no 3A, what is 3A there, okay, A is right, okay, so, so it's corticosteroids that is uh, used, proven beneficial, we started within 3 to 5 days, start tapering by seventh day and use it for nearly two weeks so short course steroid stiff course for three to five days and then taper over one week okay no definitive role for remdesivir and ivermectin in children a child presents with fever and vascular lesion of the upper limb and the lower limb neck stiffness is present the similar lesion in the palm sole and old cavity csf analysis revealed normal glucose level and elevated lymphocyte protein, what's the most likely diagnosis? Is it bacterial meningitis? Is it Coxsackie? Is it herpes? Is it TBM? I think all those who have worked in the ward will answer very quickly. You won't waste time at all. It is hand, foot, mouth disease with CNS complication. And here, please remember, CSF sugar is normal. Okay, protein is increased, cells are there. So the typical hand, foot, mouth disease CNS complication, it can come like meningitis. So, LP here, remember the sugar was normal. Next question, match the following. Again, this question, I, I mean, uh, again, this type of MCQ is not my choice. Fine, but fine, I am going to answer it. Transverse objects, social smile, pincer grass, walks, one to two steps. And you will probably do this now. Normally, the baby transfers object by... 6 to 7, social smile by 1 to 2, pincer grasp by 9 to 12 and walks 1 to 2 steps at 12 to 15 months. So the answer is here. Yeah, I think many got it right. Tarun, KK, Jane, Sophia, all have written B, which is correct. So it is B is 1B, 2A, 3D and it's become like this only. So it's very easy. This I'll go quickly. I think it's there in the book. Everybody should know milestones till the age of 5. Which of the following congenital heart disease has equal saturation of in all four chambers of the heart? Tetrogephalus, total enamus, pulmonary venous drainage, tricuspidate tracea, transposition of great vessels. Yeah, I think I see answer B, very good. D is not the correct answer, Tarun. It's B, okay. Total anomalous pulmonary venous drainage. This is where the vein will drain into the right atrium and there is admixture. Usually there has to be some uh, connection between left and right atrium and then this is one condition, all four chambers show the same saturation. So answer here is TAPVC. So TAPVC pulmonary, there is connection between right atrium and great veins. And instead of connecting to the left atrium, it drains into the right atrium. Usually, there's some, something like atrial septal defect like will be there to maintain life. And in this condition, oxygenated, deoxygenated blood mix properly. So, all four chambers have the same saturation. At what age does a child attain half height of the adult height? What is the age? 12 to 18 months, 20 to 24, 30 to 36, 40 to 48. Yes, yes, it's B which is right. You know, you become double your height at two to two and a half years. Okay, so you know, the second year height is very important. You know, two to two and a half years, whatever height is there, you are likely to be double that in adulthood. The answer is B, easy question. The 
and this table is very important from pediatrics point of view i always tell people to remember 50 at birth length then becomes 25 12.5 6 to 7 5 to 6 and Prebertal growth is 10 to 12 centimeters. Remember 50, you gained 25 centimeters in the first year. Then you became 12.5 in the second year. You gain per year. Okay. So normal growth velocity is this much. So it's good to remember this and remember your height becomes double at 4 years. And second year height is like expecting double at adulthood. NADA's minor criteria includes systolic murmur grade 3 major criteria, diastolic murmur major criteria, abnormal second sound minor criteria, abnormal BP minor criteria. These two are correct. Abnormal heart sound, abnormal BP is a minor criteria in NADA's and uh, this is good to remember. Uh, here you to have a congenital heart you need two major or one major and two minor criteria. The next question, an 18 month old child with the three days history of watery diarrhea vomiting presented with altered sensorium, which of the following is a differential diagnosis? Severe dehydration, HUS, then uh, venous thrombosis, cere cerebral venous thrombosis, hyponatremia. And three and four. I see many questions are answered as C. Very good. I think you finished uh, uh, revising pediatrics today. Very good. Hemolytic aromatic syndrome is not. You know, it will. It is not the option here. A child with diarrhea can have severe dehydration, can have thrombosis and hyponatremia because of which the child will have altered sensorium. Whereas hemolytic aromatic syndrome, there is a preceding history of diarrhea, not during the diarrhea period. Okay, so hemolytic aromatic syndrome comes as a preceding history and there is anemia, thrombocytopenia and AKI. So in diarrhea, if there is an altered sensorium, think of hyponatremia, maybe think of thrombosis or maybe think of severe dehydration. The causative agent of the condition shown in the following image is associated with which of the following disorder? Gingivus stomatitis, purate cell aplasia, molluscum contagiosum, Kaposi sarcoma. Only one. Sakshi has written B. Very good. You know, purate cell aplasia. Okay. Here, parvovirus is known to be associated with purate cell aplasia. Please, please don't go for the other option. Molluscum won't come like this. Kaposi sarcoma doesn't look like this. Gingivus stomatitis is typical of herpes. So, Parvovirus is known to be associated with pre red cell plasmidia. So, B is the right answer. Which of the following least risk of perinatal transmission? We are coming to the end of it already. You had one or two minutes more. Here, rubella. Rubella risk is maximum in the first trimester only. Towards the end, it becomes less and less. It will not be perinatally transmitted. So, okay, okay, uh, why did you write D? No. Yeah, D is the right answer, correct. It is rubella, which is re least risk of perinatal. Rubella damages the fetus in the first trimester. And that is known to produce PDA, sensory neural deafness, arthritis, and congenital heart disease. Okay. So, and cataract also. Six year old boy is brought with history of chronic cough, false smelling sputum, uh, false smelling stool, sorry. Sibling has similar complaint. Sweat chloride, CFTR gene is uh, positive. And this gene encodes which of this? KK is right, chloride. Okay, typically here the chloride channel is blocked. So there is abnormality in chlo. Okay, so the answer is chloride, that's A, that's right. Four year bald presented with fever, conjunctival congestion, erythematous disc formation. Twitter echo shows coronary anism, which is the first drug to give. Sakshi. No. IVIG. So it's Kawasaki disease. IVIG is the first. So quickly in Kawasaki, IVIG steroid and aspirin. Okay. So, first to give is IVIG and the IVIG should be given 
within 10 days. High fever, high platelet ESR, not responding to antibiotics. And then typical picture of bulbar conjunctival congestion and a very beefy tongue and then you think of Kawasaki. In Kawasaki, IVAG, steroid and aspirin. Pompe disease. So, I am going to stop. Here the answer is alpha glucosidase. Answer is A. In Pompe disease, the deficiency is in this enzymes. I thank everyone. Uh, thank everyone. I hope you had a good learning experience. Thank you.